the budget workshop in the back with a roll call. So we have Councilor Kenny, Councilor Powers, Councilor Merritt, Just Councilor Marks, and Councilor Baker uh, with us now. We'll um, potentially welcome a couple more counselors as we get going. Um, tonight we're going to uh, the first item up is Department of Departmental Operating and Capital Plan Review for Public Safety, then Police, then Fire, Emergency Medical Services, Emergency Management, and Hazardous Materials Response. So Cornell, you want to? Take us off and introduce uh, Public Safety Administration. Chief Merrill's here. 52. Chief Merrill, would you mind introducing yourself for those who aren't used to seeing you outside of uniform or just for the viewing public at large? Play a trick on everybody. Yeah. No, I'm in uh, I'm in training all week, so that's the purpose for looking a little more incognito. Um, so I'm Dan Merrill and I'm the police chief. So tonight I'm gonna lay out our budget um, for public safety administration. I'm gonna just cover my secretary and tell you um, So as far as support goes for my, oh, actually, excuse me, I'm gonna back up a second. Cornell asked that I give you guys an update on our details that we've done thus far, the school bus stuff. Um, so if you, if you don't mind, love it, just take a second. Um, so to date, you're looking at, it's been about five weeks. Um, we've done 18 details that would have covered 112 traffic stops, um, three criminal summonses for passing stop school buses. And we have, we're obviously, Couple of details that were done earlier this week that we don't have statistics back in on yet, but um, from my perspective, for five weeks, that's those are those are good numbers. I know anecdotally, um, I was just in one of the local businesses on Monday, and one of the business owners commented to me that they've been seeing a lot of lights on Main Street. So, well, you ask and you shall receive. So, I would say, did you say eighteen patrols? 18 details thus far. 18 yep. patrol details, 112 stops, stops with three criminal violations. Um, so warnings for 100. Had a couple. Yeah. Um, one, two, see, three, mm -hmm. three warnings for the passing. Um, and I know in speaking with some of those, again, they're all on a like case by case basis, but I think some of them are over on the Stillwater Avenue section that we talked about, mm -hmm. where's the four lane section. Yeah. Um, and then some others. Where it's just been kind of an extenuating circumstance, special circumstance that we, you know, we look at them all case by case, right? Mm -hmm. But some of those 112 would have been just run of the mill tickets too, right? And then some of them would have been warnings or. Yes. Yeah. So I don't have the exact breakdown on like summons that we've written warnings, yeah. okay. just 112 stops overall. Yep. Um, I can tell you as a general overview of what they've been for is um, inspection violations. So that would be your inspection sticker. Um, registrations, there's been speeding, um, some distracted driving. So all the things that we pretty much talked, we wanted to make a point of focus and emphasis for, um, I think we focused on. So I think that if you guys are satisfied, obviously the plan will be to keep doing them for the last, the last, yeah. the last half. Yeah, definitely. The last half of the 12 weeks, you mean? The 10 weeks? Yes. Was it 10 weeks or 12? And I think it was, was going to be about 12 weeks, 11, 12 weeks, something yep. like that. So, you know, we're probably at the halfway point by now. Great. And you said the actual um, summons for school bus passing was three of those and three warnings on those yep. as well. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's so great. So yep. appreciated. Yep. And we have had um, one of our day shift officers too, as he's had time, has just kind of hit and miss been following the buses too, sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon. Like we talked about, if if time allows and calls allow, you know, if one of the details isn't working, then he'll go out and follow that bus around. Um, I think from some of the feedback I've gotten from some of my staff, they've been talking with the bus driver. She seems to be um, appreciative of what we've been doing and they're talking with her and making sure, I think they're kind of debriefing after they do them sometimes to make sure that they're not missing anything and that they're on the same page and whatnot. So mm -hmm. I, I would say overall, from my perspective, I'm very happy with what staff's doing and and I think it's, it's successful. So. People have noticed a difference. Um, absolutely. absolutely, yeah, people send me, Pictures of buses and patrol cars behind them, um, yes. and it, it seems like there's more 
presence on on the streets as well, apart from not just following buses around. So to the extent that our staffing levels have accommodated that, that's been fantastic. Yes, we are. As one of the things I will talk about tonight, we are trending in the right direction. Great. Being full staffed is very helpful. These are the things that we can do when we have staff that's supported, you know, to get a little plug in for the budget. This is the things that we can do when we have the adequate budget that we request, right? It's, okay. These are the extra programs that we can do to some degree. Okay. And staff. And staff. <laughs> staff is very important. It has been a three or four year battle to get to where we are, and I'm ecstatic as to where we are. Yep. I see we have uh, a yeah, with a hand. Yep. My hand is raised. I'm curious if whoever is running tech could promote me to panelist. Um, and I might be uh, off camera a little bit as I'm still transitioning and wrangling things, but I wanted to be able to make sure I was present at this whole meeting. So joining over Zoom and here. Okay, thank you, Council Bertso. So looks like um, looks like Pete has you promote. I don't know if he's got you promoted now or not, but I'm sure he will. Good, thank you. All right, let's. We all set with that? Yeah. Much well, on that? I'm going to have some comments on it at the end of your presentation, but yeah. um, and some, you know, be ready for an idea. <laughs> I got my I said it's an idea that comes with appreciation and resources. So, okay. yeah. So, starting off with my with support staff, so my public safety administration, um, that would be Jessica Mason. She's our administrative assistant that's upstairs in the, in the police department. She does... He's basically my right-hand person in the police department that does anything that I ask her to do, projects, she keeps me on task, she gets bills prepared, she's the person that you talk to on the phone when people call the 4,000 line, um, she takes care of parking tickets, um, concealed weapons permits for me, um, some of my time data that I have to report to the state, she works on that along with Ed Leska, the community police resource officer. Um, and child safety inspection seats. That's a big thing that she does. It's very important for the town um, and things like that. Um, so that's basically what we have for support staff or for her for administration. Um, Ed under community policing is in a different section. It's in my uh, regular police budget. So if you guys have any questions on public safety administration, what Jessica does, she is crucial part of what it is I do on a day-to-day -day basis, especially on weeks like this where I'm at training, even though I'm here at training, she can still keep things going next door with the phones and bills and whatnot. So it's extremely helpful. Dispatch is all 911, correct? Yes. So sometimes what'll happen is she'll take an, a non-emergency phone call. So if somebody calls the, the 866-4000 number during the day, um, to make a complaint, as long as it's not a 911 call, it'll go to her first. She'll say, oh, you need to go to dispatch, and then she'll patch them through over to Penobscot Regional and Bangor, and they'll take the complaint and they'll get it to our officers. So she basically just intakes the call and then triages it off. Yep. <clears throat> Very high level, because I'm sure it's way more complicated than this simple question, but what's, since I'm new, what's the interaction between university police and orgs? Again, you know, it's conceptually very high level. I would say very good, and we're there as resources to each other, I would say, for collaborative events. So like when I put out in one of my weekly reports with um, Cornell, yep. special events, stuff like that. Graduation, we help a lot on graduation. We help them a lot on sport events, sporting events, special details, things like that. Um, and, you know, going the other way, they have resources up there that we can use if we need to, whether it's a building for training or um, parking. We've used parking lots before for driving training and stuff like that. So I think the, the chief and I up there and just the staff up there, we talk frequently. Um, so it's a very good relationship. And it's just like, to be honest, the other mutual aid um, towns that surround us, BZ and Old Town. We, we work together. If they call and they need something, we're, we're there and we go. Um, does that answer your question? It, it does. So um, there is some stuff that I have to do. Actually, it's one of the things that I have to do annually. Um, so they have Cleary. 
the student safety reporting and stuff like that. So, you know, I have to help them with that. Usually at the beginning of every year, they'll send me a letter looking for our statistics for Cleary. So I have to pull that stuff. I actually just submitted that to them not too long ago. Um, so it's things like that. Teams will send me that. Sometimes when they stay at some of the hotels here in town, they'll send me the statistics requesting it for their records and whatnot. So things like that. So like if you all help out with, you know, graduation, so you sent some details up there. Does it university reimburse you for that cost? Yep. Okay, they do. Yep. Yep. So, yep. So it depends on who it's through. If we work a sporting event, my understanding is athletics usually will pay the bill. Yeah. Um, and graduation, I'm not really sure which one. But the town does receive reimbursement yep. for your service. Yep. yep. Exactly. We'll invoice it out. We put it on our time card and then you build it up to them. So, yeah. Thank you. In yeah. terms of jurisdiction, do you have, you have jurisdiction throughout Orono, right? Even on university property? Yep. Do they have jurisdiction throughout Orono as well or just on university property? Um, Mostly just on the university main property. It would, like I said, it would be like Horn on Old Town, where if we needed help on somewhere and they were the closest, they could obviously come off campus to help us. Sure. Um, sometimes when you might see them, quote unquote, off campus, would be at you know some of the fraternity houses or some of the properties that they have there along College Avenue. You know, they obviously have to go through town to get to those. Um, even the research facility over on Godfrey Drive, that's technically a university main building. Yeah. Um, a research it's a, facility. It's a pick lab. Pick, the, yeah, yeah, pick lab. Yeah, yeah they do. Cooperative extension. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, so fundamentally, fundamentally and operationally, I basically, we let them be autonomous to themselves, right? Because they have a full time, they have a full time police department. They have their own budget. Their officers go through all the same training as our officers. So they operate as their own separate entity. But we do have, like I said, a very good working relationship. And if they need something or we need something, then they're just a call away. So right. a little difficult because they're on a different radio channel, but that's fair in line from the grand scheme of things. Yep. All right. So, yep. Okay. So the police department as a whole, we are composed of 16 full-time employees, but that would include the one administrative assistant. Um, so it's myself the captain i have three patrol sergeants um our detective sergeant seven officers in patrol ed lesky who's our community resource officer uh, excuse me um dan patterson who's our community services officer who works in the school of the sro um and then ed lesky who is the director of community policing who's non-sworn so that would be the 16 and jessica mason the administrators so 16 full-time employees um, we typically average about 5,000 calls for service. I was actually just looking at those again this morning, actually just before the meeting, and somehow within five calls for service in the last two years, we've been pretty consistent. So it was 5,257 calls for service in 2023 and 5,252 calls for service in 2022. Um, so that's just, uh, yeah. I think we're just consistent and uh, calls are very consistent. Um, so to cover all those calls for service, we have those, I would say the 14 sworn and then Ed and the administrative assistant. For capital equipment, we have two administrative vehicles that would be my vehicle and the captain's vehicle. Um, the detective sergeant has an emergency response vehicle. Um, the four marked cars, when I say a marked car, those are the cars that you see out every day that have decals all over the side that say Orno Police, um, the big stickers on the back so you don't get rear-ended at nighttime and whatnot. Um, one spare car that we would use as a backup car when one of the frontline cars goes down or has some major mechanical issue where it's going to be down for you know more than just a day. Um, and then one pool car. It doesn't have any police equipment in it. Typically, when I I brought that in last year, I actually had to get rid of it because it got too expensive and I didn't want to keep the car. But with this budget, if we can get another car, um, it would be a car that would be good for Ed to use for community policing because it doesn't have any police equipment in it. Um, if you were doing the tours like we did on Monday, it's just a car pool. I call it like a pool car because it doesn't have any police equipment in it. Um, it would be a car that we would cycle out of our fleet 
but I think it would still have use overall to the department and the town as a whole. Um, so that would be a, a, a pool car, if you would. So that would get us to nine cars, all told. So big areas of discussion for my budget as it comes to capital stuff. Um, taser lease, you'll see in my budget, is going to expire at the end of FY25. So that's a lease agreement that we enter into annual or every five years. It's a five-year cycle with taser. So that lease payment's on there. Um, our lease payment that will cover all of our body-worn cruiser cameras, audio video equipment is also in the capital plan. That's a lease agreement that we're tied to. Um, and you'll also see my request for one more or one um, frontline cruiser. If, if we were to get that cruiser, that cruiser was accepted, um, it would be a hybrid, which would get all four of my frontline cars to hybrid technology, which you would see in my budget as I was looking at it this afternoon, the, the hybrids are panning out as we would expect. Um, I'm seeing pretty significant gas savings actually to the point where it's one of the things that I, my gas budget line is one thing that I reduced by several thousand dollars for my operating budget um, because of the fuel savings that we're seeing. Um, I, think, I think my fuel line's 60% spent, 55 or 60% spent at this point in the year. So, you know, between gas prices maybe not being as high as we projected last year and the use of the hybrids, I think that we're, we're really seeing some fuel savings there. So it's, it's beneficial for sure. Um, <clears throat> Dan, did we get, did you get a new hybrid last year? I guess you, this yeah. is last year. Yep. Um, so I've, this would be the fourth year of requesting. So that was, that's what would get me to the last one. Did we, Part of our change last year, didn't we agree to do one? Now yeah, we agreed to do it one per year on a for the cruisers or that kind of the cycle we're on. We discussed last year because I'd asked for two last year. Yeah. But we discussed funding one and then putting away fifteen or twenty thousand dollars towards an account where in three years mm -hmm. I would be able to buy two. Okay. <clears throat> um. It would, so would that Total be nine. So did a did a vehicle come out of the fleet last year? Uh, I don't think I cycled any out, no. Okay. There's one because you said the total. Yes, I did. Yeah, I cycled one out, but it it had a like a motor failure or something in it where I I'd even talked with Sophie where this this pool car thing is something kind of new that I'm trying to use to even save some. Um, training travel expenses if I have to, because like right now, um, if I have somebody at the academy and I need all my frontline cars, I have to pay that person mileage at 55 or 60 cents a mile, that sound right? 67. 60, 67 cents a mile. So for, I think my person to drive back and forth to the academy one week costs us $80. More than that. Yeah, it's it's almost a hundred dollars. In last years, there was there was a training yes vehicle, no yes. police equipment. Yes. So that one had a motor issue and I just got rid of it. Well, they didn't want to spend the money into it endlessly. So I would like to try and see if I can make this car that we're gonna cycle out last longer. Does that make sense? Yep. Because in the past and in the past we have um given them a second life. With public works too, some of their facilities vehicles, but I haven't heard of a huge need there. Um, and like I said, with with how much Ed does on a day to day basis, driving around and getting places, it's useful for him to have it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's if you know, I would say that I'm making a concerted effort to keep an eye on how much that car might cost us as far as repairs go to see if it's still worth keeping. Because so there's only I don't even know what a dealership would give us give us for those cars. You know, they're gonna have a significant amount of miles on them and they're five or six years old by now. So my theory is the amount that we would get in a trade-in, I have that amount of value that I could get back in one budget year. And I would just keep it until it's not, you know, fiscally responsible anymore. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. And I guess maybe this is more for 
Cornell, but there is, uh, because I wondered about using that for code, uh, there is a lease ending and starting a new one, planning to start a new one, which is 3,600 a year. I wondered about that, depending on that fleet, the, this vehicle that was, would be retired, you'd be retiring if that would be a potential option, but that's for another conversation. I guess. But I wanted to put that out there as something to consider. Are we good with the cars? Yeah. Yeah. Car. yeah. Um, so major budget increases that you'll see, um, I'd say the biggest one is the wage increase, but that's due in part, not in part, that's due to the agreed upon union contract. It'll take effect in July 1. Um, and I did increase my routine maintenance line because I found this budget year that repairs in general are just becoming more. The cost of services has just gone up, so I moved that line up $1,000. Um, so those are the major budget increases that I had. Uh, how does our uh, negotiated contract compare with uh, neighboring communities? I know that there's, you know, seeing your report, there is poaching, I guess, is that a politically correct term? I yeah. Yeah. As safe as I can be. It's an accurate term, yes. Yeah. yes. So how does, how does our, that increase that we approved for our, um, you know, law enforcement? I, it's, it, it makes us competitive, mm -hmm. which, is, which is good. Um, I know that there was uh, a wage study that was done by another agency in this area that was shared with, with myself and other area departments just to kind of see even where department heads were sitting, you know, chiefs and captains mm -hmm. and, and overall benefits and stuff like that. And, and I would say that with the contract that we have and the wages that we have in place for this upcoming budget, it's everybody's competitive, which is good. Um, <clears throat> you'll remember a few years ago, we went off cycle from some of the other agencies. So, Old Town's still in their Old Town's going in their last year of their union contract, but we're entering into our first year. So it'll be interesting to see where their wages go next year. Um, but like I said, as of right now, we're we're competitive and they'd have to get really significant raises. Because even in the year two and year three um negotiated portions of the contract, I think that it's it's got good wages increases as far as cost of living goes, right? Yeah. Um, built in, so I think that we're I think that we're in good shape there. Good, just good. And I just just glad to see that you're fully staffed. And mm. I think from the from the budget perspective, it's hopefully it'll turn out as planned. Your unscheduled overtime, you budgeted twenty. We spent we're spending forty four this year, and, you, and you're only budgeting twenty again. So that's a good sign that yeah. that's going to pay off there as well. And obviously, mm. in addition to staff not being completely um, burned around the edge. Burned. Yes. So very helpful. It's good. Appreciate the efforts to to get us back to full full staff. And I know it's a long time coming. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that it remains. Matt and I are gonna blow that out of the water with our bus, you know, bus uh, plan <laughs> yeah. next year. Yeah. Teasing Leo. Like you're not yeah, that's the thing. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not the overtime. When you came up to full staffing, what when did that happen when we got up to full staffing? So <laughs> technically speaking, I still have one open spot in my schedule, but that's only until Friday. I have my last officer graduating the academy on Friday. He takes his certification test tomorrow. Um, I have no concerns that he'll have any issues with that. He's done a great job. Um, so the last officer we would have brought on would have probably been in the tail end of last year. We hired two or three, like in November, December of last year. It would have got all the spots filled. Um, but like I said, then we sent one away to the academy in January. So all my spots in the schedule, as of planned right now, will be filled in the next month or so, which is... Very good. As of Friday, everybody yeah. out of the academy. So, we'll be, so he'll come. So his plan will be is that he's been gone to the academy. So starting like Sunday night, Monday, we don't just stick him in their own car and let him go out and <laughs> do great things. We will put him in with a field training officer for a couple weeks, a month, um, and just get him reoriented back to the town, get him familiar with working shift work again, and get him acclimated back before we throw him out there in the schedule. Though, go make. Great decisions. Do good things. 
<laughs> which he will. I know he was going to do a good job. Uh, budget savings. Can you, can you just answer one more salary yeah. question? Yeah. Um, on, I guess it's page 29, where it jumps over from the regular public safety police department budget to the community policing budget. Um, I just wanted to know the salaries that are included on this line are the director of community policing as well as what does this mean here? Plus base hourly wage for community services officer. This is the officer in the schools yeah. typically. Yeah. And what's that mean when it's base hourly wage? Is that somehow different than how everybody else is recorded? Or why is that? I'm, I mean, his overtime shows in other places is what yeah. you're saying, but yeah. his base wage is at the school. Yes. And okay. the school gives us 50% Zach, yeah. right? So there's a 50% wage um, offset by the school for the services up there. Okay. So for the community services officer, we yep. pay 50%. Yep. Um, the RSU's budget covers 50% yeah. for us. Okay. And then for the director of community policing, 50% of those wages are allocated to the TIF and economic development. Is that correct? Yes. That's okay. interesting. Got it. Where does the administrative assistant salary show? Is that back on the first? Yep, it's in the administrative, okay. public safety administration all the way at the top. Yep, perfect. My Thank budget. You. That was, I just was trying to understand who was where and who was yep. paid by who. Thank you. Um, so a big, a big budget cut for me would be in, it was housed in the community policing line. Um, it was $8,000 that had been in my budget for the last, few years for staffing out to the public school's landing for the details out there. It was something where it came up against, it, it came up about last year, we said we'd like to do it. Um, and I don't know, well, I know why, but it just so happened that after the budget was approved, I started reaching out to the company to say, hey, can you guys do it? And they said, no, we're going out of business actually. And I just got left high and dry all of last year. and. Um, I don't even see a massive uptick in um, need or concern, I would say, out there with them missing. So I thought it was prudent to remove that from the budget where I don't foresee myself being able to staff it with a private company. And I don't think it's anything that we could fill on a part-time nature with somebody else. So, so I, I put in there that I think it's something that we can augment to some degree with Ed during his services mm -hmm. as the director of community policing throughout just the day and stuff. You can go out there and check and be aware of things, but um, that was what I thought was in the best interest. Mm -hmm. are, we, are we on that page 29? Well, I, I did have a question with um, public safety and community policing. Um, it's on page 29. Salary for director of community policing, DCP, as well. As well. Oh, that's what you just asked. I think you did. Well, you just asked about sorry. I was. But are there two people in the community policing role? Yes, there are. So the and, resource officer is in that is considered in that role too. Yep. Full time. Yes. Full time, and then fifty percent of that is two. So. So Officer Patterson, Officer Patterson's in that line because 50% of his time is spent in the schools as the school resource officer, especially now where we're full staff and need to be up there full time. Um, during a good portion of last budget year while we were short staffed, he was kind of wearing both hats. He was helping us cover calls for service in town while still being in the school. Um, now that I have the staff to be able to Cover the calls for service. He's up. He's been up in the school exclusively since probably the beginning of this year. I think the end of last year, the beginning of last year, he's been able to go back to being just a dedicated school resource officer, where he's up in the schools every day. So, does that answer your question? Just from parental observation and interactions, he seems like a great fit up there. Oh, absolutely great. Yes. Ed obviously was phenomenal yeah. as well. Yeah. So it's nice. Yeah. yeah no, I think. See. I think. Uh, Officer Patterson is, he's made it his own. It's different. He's, he's got a different approach than Ed had, but I, I haven't heard any bad things. I know he's, you know, I think he's doing some unique things with marketing himself and really getting out there to know the kids and 
he's got a rubber stamp that he has that he's proud of. That he likes to stamp kids' yearbooks with and things. And I think he's he's hosted trainings on advanced SRO and he's actually at a two day training today and tomorrow. He's at a two day training for policing the team brain. So he's he's really interested in all in on figuring out different ways to interact with the students and staff and children of all ages just to make it a better it's a relationship between us and the school. Yeah, so very valuable asset to have. Yeah. For now, can I ask just on the FTEs, um, the FTE page that we just got handed out, the number here that shows for the police department is pretty different than the one in our budget binder. We have 16 here for FTEs and we have 13 and a half on this FTE page. Uh, I'm guessing some of that is what you just explained to me that the community services officer is half time funded by the school. Community policing is half time funded. I guess maybe that's not count. I don't know where is that counting if it's not counting under police. Something seems strange about those numbers. Hmm. And also, like something with, with that. Um, maybe that's a question for later. Like but if safety we could, administrative. Maybe that's just the something. Assistant is down at the bottom. Oh, the administrative assistant separated. There's two down there. Um, where does that show? It's the very bottom of that page, 187. So oh, that would public be. safety admin, yeah. right? So we see one there. But where are the other? So there would be one for us and one for the fire department. I only spoke to ours. I don't know if that's what you guys are seeing. Sure. But Jeff has one also. I just meant if you have 16 and one yeah. is administrative assistant, that should still put us at 15. And the police department on this other page is only showing 13 and a half FTEs. Yeah, the patrol is, should be um, seven. One overarching question I had with that, with this um, FTE, FTE, FTE yeah. was is this actual or is this what we, or is this? Like budget, full staff. Yeah, full staff. It almost feels like it was. It almost feels at times that it might have been um, actual versus what we have on the books. But I don't. It's not real clear to me. That would be a good, maybe overall question to understand with this document: Is it actual or budgeted? I believe it is actual at the time that I ran the report. Through you think so? Okay. So that would explain you. That's that's that. That it still doesn't make well. That does that could explain it because the new person he ran this, they were coming there, they were hiring, and yeah, some of the jobs don't show at any rate. Maybe that's something we can look into further and figure out. Some of the titles don't even seem to show on the FTE page, like community services officer. I can't figure out where that's being captured. Anyhow, maybe that's a later question. Thanks. So these documents, when they come in, they come in, right? I mean, the department heads bring documents to the manager's office, and then we get these reports that come in through the, whatever the, what's the name of the, the reporting system? Was Trio. Trio. So is that where there may be some ADP is our payroll software. That's what okay. I'm Is that, so when we see some discrepancies sometimes, is that kind of what's going on? A lot of it's a timing thing. If we yeah. had vacancies at the point the report was ran, and sometimes the software don't doesn't speak super well to each other, and that can cause some of the issues as well. Yep. Okay. okay. Thanks. What it seems like is maybe just completely missing is the community services. Yeah. Sir. Just going to say this. Yes. Um, that one, and then the one the administrative assistant. Yeah, I see administrative assistant down below. We'll get it figured out. Thanks. Yeah. But the sixteen is the correct number in in this report. Thanks. Uh, and, and community service is not in economic It's just where I think the proportion of or should be as well. We'll get it figured out. Thanks, Elon. All right. Anything else, Steph? Um, Staffing is good. <laughs> Something, something that I want to touch on, and I know it's something that we talked about bringing back up in um, July, will be um, just want to say for the record that continuing to keep the idea and notion of the need for some exploration around the public safety building is going to be important to employer retention and recruitment too. 
Um, it, it's something where uh, it's important to the current employees that are coming into the workforce and somebody that might lateral over. If somebody's going to lateral over, they're going to try and at least step up or break even to what they might have from where they're coming from, right? If it's, a, if it's an agency our same size, um, I think the things that we have going in our favor for sure is pay is good. Um, we have good equipment. You know, we're, we're current on our technology as far as it goes with body-worn cameras um, and digital digital preservation and, you know, technology and stuff like that, cars and the computer. We have, we have good tools and equipment. I think our biggest drawback right now is, is the space constraints in our building is really what's holding us back to some degree. Um, there are other places around that have newer buildings with more spaces that, you know, it's just to be, to be consistent with area agencies. It's something that I would not want to see fall off. So whatever that means to you guys. Thank you. That's my only other plug I have. Thank you. And we've got work to do on that front, certainly, as we get around, uh, as we think about our facilities. The time for questions. Are you okay? So I've been incredibly impressed with the um, the responsiveness on the, the bus stop piece. And I'm interested, I know Matt and I have talked about it, um, about some sort of, I, I think about Orono, or the reality of Orono is that we're, we're the epicenter of young drivers in Maine. We're inexperienced drivers. Um, we have, we're the, the second youngest community in Maine, um, apart from just Castine, uh, which is a month or two younger. And owing to the fact that we have, you know, a couple thousand um, inexperienced drivers joining us in the fall, you know, we welcome, welcome folks to our community and all the things. But I'm very interested in, um, in doubling down on um, keeping the kind of momentum I think that you've achieved and the goodwill you've built with the community, with this work and the responsiveness to the school bus concerns in terms of, I'd like to see us every August, every April, do uh, you know, an enforcement education initiative coupled with the work that we're going to do around infrastructure. You know, we've got work, we're doing everything from the stoplight changes that, that Mitch has looked into, the, the additional radar signs we're going to install, the work that we're doing um, on Forest Avenue, the traffic calming, the Route 2 corridor work that will eventually be coming forward to really demonstrate to the community that they've been heard when it comes to um, comes to safety, uh, walkability and safety in our community for pedestrians and, and bicyclists, particularly our children. So <clears throat> I'm interested in knowing what it would take within the resources you have now to do a similar, you know, welcome to Orono, you know, like a Orono stops initiative, you know, Orono stops for school buses, Orono stops at sidewalks, uh, at crosswalks and Orono stops speeders and distracted drivers. And, you know, making it working, partnering with the university to make sure um, I've talked to people up there and they'd be willing to help us kind of get the word to students. Um, we register, you know, students down in the cars downstairs, the clerk's office, having a handout and things like I'm taking like a branded initiative backed up by enforcement, backed up by education um, and backed up by infrastructure improvements that we can show people when they come to this town that we have an expectation that we're going to drive safely and um, be a place where people can walk and bike. And I, I want people with, with young kids to feel like they can send their kids to, if, if they're of a, of a certain age, be able to walk to the library or the school without being concerned about um, their kids' safety. So what do you think, what would you need from us to be able to do? One, I think it involves engagement with the university community and, and you know the communications department here at the town. Um, over the summer to, to package a, a, a plan, an initiative, but what do you think it would take in terms of resources to do four to six weeks of, you know, heightened enforce visibility around enforcement? At, um, you know, best practice, you come to us and tell us what you think, do we run them tickets? Do we give them warnings? You know, those kinds of things. But in terms of having the, the people power to, to make it clear that, you know, this is a community that's gonna have high expectations for uh, vehicle safety. Um, a bunch of different ways we could tackle that. And I think that everything that you mentioned is a good idea. Uh, I know that when we talked about the bus safety initially, um, like I said before, somebody from the university reached out to me with the same idea that you'd had where 
when students come in as part of new student orientation, maybe there's some safety component that they could bring to them that's, you know, and I know that I've heard in the past, they talk about being good neighbors and being good stewards of the, you know, the full-time residents of Orno, mm -hmm. if you would. Um, I think certainly that there's always room for us to do more enforcement, um, but with, so I would say with that, that would be one of those things where if you guys, if, if it was the council's desire to allow money or direct money towards that, like we did with the buses outside of my normal budget or adding money to my operational budget, then that's something that we can obviously do as staff allows. Um, mm -hmm. It's something that we try and do, or we do, we do do, um, just on a day-to-day -day basis in response to Forest Avenue or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just, like I said before, that might be an hour at a time, half hour, hour at a time, because if you get called away, they got to go to the mm -hmm. other calls for service. Um, so budget-wise, I would say that if it was something that we wanted to allocate money towards, then we could earmark some money for that. Um, I can tell you right now, I'm looking at my budget and I was just talking with Zach about it. Anecdotally, the school bus details thus far have cost us just over $5,000. And that's been for five weeks? That's for 18 details. 18 details, $5,000. 18 four-hour details. Um, so, you know, I could get you, if we had some, I think that it would be a place where we could have discussions about what it is you guys would like as far as time, time domain and money. Is it mm -hmm. time that you're concerned about? Like as far as, like you said, is it two weeks? And we put a full court press on where it's, you know, five to 10 details or is it something that you want to do sporadically. Um, it's obviously something where the captain and I have already talked about trying to continue to make this bus enforcement um, in the fall, something that we keep on our radar, something we bring back on our radar where just like we are right now, if, if we have multiple officers working, maybe one of the officers that's available can just tail the bus mm -hmm. and do that as part of our normal day-to-day -day operations. Mm -hmm. um, but to actually do dedicated patrols, that's going to cost yep. extra money. Can you give us a sense, or I guess, could, could we get a sense of what that would cost for, and what you think the best practice would be in terms of, you know, is it four weeks? Is it two weeks? Just, you know, getting everybody going, you know, what do you think is best practice? I'm not going to elaborate like I usually do, right? Just what do you think the best practice is? Or what do you think it will cost? And, yeah. We'll save a little bit of money because you have a person away at the academy that will now be full time. Yep. Yep. So that we could do some details. Mm -hmm. That person has been gone so that even these details have created some over time. Yeah. Um, I would suggest that Dan take some time and meet with the university, meet with staff and Pete and mm -hmm. develop a program and then come back because this is how it's could work. Because um, maybe they can cover some details on, on that end of town, but um, yeah, and we need to pursue yeah. that and see whether they would be on board with kind of the the plan. So maybe they could work on a plan and come back to you with yeah. I, I'm just like to not put this budget to bed without making sure we have some resources that are, are you know, from I'm speaking as one counselor, um, but I'll speak to all the other counselors too, you know, and um, I would like very much to spend time this summer and, you know, when people come back in the fall, you know, in the late summer, have an announcement and speak with intentionality about our intent to to make a place or know that, that community where um, it's that integrated Infrastructure enforcement education to make corners. I think safe. you ought to put like five thousand dollars in and see if he can leverage that with the university. To <laughs> okay, that's easy enough. And some of that in in my actual budget to speak to what Cornell said in that community policing budget, some of what we in the past have used the wages line for that's funded for five thousand dollars. Um, we've used to try and, you know, I would say that it's in the, in that spirit of if it was bike patrols or stuff like that, we would mm -hmm. fund those wages through that line. So currently that line would be budgeted for $5,000 in this budget. So, you know, that would be where 
if you guys wanted to put some more money in a budget line, that would be where I would fund it out of. What's the what's the number? Yeah, is that the same one that you removed the eight thousand from? Yes. Yep. So what line is it? So it would be twenty twenty three. Did he policing? Yeah. Twenty twenty three five ten one thirty nine. Twenty twenty three five ten one thirty nine. I'm in trio. I don't have the hard copy one. I'm looking at trio itself. Page 29. All right, so you've like asked for 5,000 in that. Cornell, you're suggesting we yes, put another sir. page 29 right in the middle of the page. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's the line that I took the $8,000 out of because we were funding the Gould's Landing details out of that. Plus, it was a line, like I said, that some community policing enforcement events I would put out of there. Okay. So, and how would we, how would we task the, the manager to do? It's just part of the budget and understand, you know, like a, a separate order, do you think, or? Uh, no, it'd be part of the budget. So I don't know as we need an order, need an order at, this, okay. at this point. Okay. We're just adding 5,000. It'll be part of the order when you approve the whole okay. budget. Okay. Dan, can I maybe to Cornell's point, though, also, now that we're full staff, maybe we kind of hear what we can do under the current budget as well before we're adding money back into the budget. It'd be a thought. Yeah. Um, and as far as like downstairs, my hunch is probably not a lot of people are registering cars, but maybe voter reg would be a good time to be giving them something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. 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 Especially going into November. Yeah. I'm sure. It's a good idea. That's it. Dan, do we still run, yeah? Do we still run bicycle patrols much? We, we have them, right? We do. We, we do actually. One of my one of my supervisors actually just came to us and asked us about that last week. He 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 was the one that would do it quite a bit last year, and it's one of those staffing things, right? Where I have more staff now, so um, I think he was actually looking to dig it out. We keep it up at Public Works for storage for the winter time. So yeah, I would expect. Um, Maybe in the next week or so, you get some days like this where you might see somebody on a bike. Yes. So, yeah. And the last question I had is on the traffic initiative that's been going on. I know um, community members were also especially interested in crosswalk mm -hmm. uh, stoppage and people stopping actually at the crosswalks for people. Has there been any tickets issued for that? Have any officers been tracking that at all? Or is that not really happened? I haven't, I haven't seen any stops specifically mentioned for that. But I would assume that it, to some degree, would mean that the places where I've seen some of our officers has been like from the police department to Kelly Road, very heavy right now, um, and on the other side of Kelly Road. Um, so that that would be. But if that's something that we do with the university initiative, that could definitely be targeted and be part of it. Because I know that's the other thing I'm still hearing from the community is. No, you know, people don't stop at the crosswalk still, and what we can do to change that culture more. So, the same with Orono stops. Yeah, right. I agree. Stops. I just yeah. think it's important to reiterate. Genius. There were, and there was something. Like you guys, if you guys go back, I know I couldn't tell you when, but it's been probably five or six years ago. We've done something before where I know uh, Josh Ewing had come up with a heads up campaign that we did in combination with um, the Bureau of Highway Safety. It was the same thing. It was a marketing campaign where it was bringing awareness to distracted driving. I think it was around the time when the distracted driving law came in new. And they wanted to make a big push on that. So we had a marketing campaign. There used to be a, a banner up at the high school, one one text could rack it or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that was ours. This the we, we the get, department of the school did that. I don't remember. Sometimes we get informational banners and packets and whatnot from the Bureau of Highway Safety that would come from um, like the federal government. They send them to the local partners at Maine and they'll send them out to the local police departments as display ads and things like that. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen any though recently. Obviously, if you're already kind of going to answer on that front, maybe that's something. That'd be wonderful. And that, yeah. that would be great. Grants is something that I had in the, in my budget that I talked about we can explore too for the fall. The cycle opens, I think, in October, I believe, the federal cycle opens. So that's something that I can come back to you guys in the fall about. I need to for some money to it, we'd like. Thank you. I think you've got a great, um, I think your, your 
police officers in Orono, we just they feel like a really great fit for our community. And I think it's a testament to the training and, and your leadership. Um, so thank you for that. And just every interaction um, I get or hear about, just seems really positive and a really good fit for who you are as a community. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah. Oh, oh, did we, are we going to put, um, this is a, maybe it's a public works, but signage about stopping for buses on Stillwater where there are four lanes. Did we, I know we talked about Farmington or somebody having them. Um, I think you and I have to talk. I was yeah. circle back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, we, so Mitch and Mike Smart and I have, have talked about that. We got some signage ideas from Farmington. Mm -hmm. I think we just need to circle back on we actually going to order those signs. It's a very basic sign, but I, I like basic convenient signs. Yeah. It, yeah. So yes, we can circle back on that for sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Chief Sol, are we on, on to you? So thank you for joining us. Thank you. And fire department starts on page 66. <laughs> Hey, would it uh, be okay? Uh, I guess at this point, I just want to acknowledge and uh, thank Chief Lowe for, I think, coming up on five years of service, correct? Uh, six. six. A little over six. A little over six, sorry. So, obviously, uh, we have heard that you've, you've attended your resignation, and uh, I just want to thank you for, were you the first person in this type of role for one and over now? Um, no, there was at least one way back. Okay. And, For a uh, person in a while. Yeah. And it didn't, I don't think it lasted very long. So okay. I think I probably got the most tenure in this, this type of role. So, well, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, appreciate you, you moving us forward. Maybe, maybe too far forward at times since it's, it's hard to keep our good, uh, firemen that are getting trained so well, <laughs> but we appreciate, uh, appreciate your work. <clears throat> Sure. Yeah. Um, so a uh, quick update on that, uh, since Councilor Kenny brought it up, is uh, we have an internal uh, candidate that we're going to bring up to, um, I believe we're going to bring up to uh, acting deputy fire chief, which will make sure there's at least some consistency in the administrative portion. Um, he is a union member, so I have to uh, go through the process with the union to make sure that his rights are protected to include being able to go back to the floor. Um, if he doesn't become a, a full-time administrator and there's uh, certain things that have to be agreed upon to make that happen. Um, I don't expect it'll be a hurdle. Um, but as soon as I have that person dialed in, I'll let you know who it is and, and, um, uh, the scope of their work and, and those types of things. Primarily they're, they're going to be there to make sure that issues are managed and, and things are handled. So thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, my name is Jeff Lowe. I'm the director of public safety here uh, in the town of Warno. And um, I want to, Council Marks uh, actually flagged me on something that I meant to mention in the OMR. Uh, if you look at our current resources, for some reason I have 25 FTEs noted there, and that's not an accurate number. I, I don't know. I must have fallen and hit my head or something. I want to do that. Within the fire department itself, there are actually uh, 27. Um, and then we have the one uh, admin um, that Dan mentioned earlier um, that falls under the, the public safety administration. So that's that's a, a typo that I did there somewhere. I, for some reason, I don't know exactly what I was doing there. Um, I'll start off where Dan started off, where we talk about public safety administration. I do have uh, one administrator in the fire department. Um, you know, she's uh, captured under that public safety administration line. Um, she uh, provides support basically to myself, the deputy, the fire prevention officer, the inspector, and all of the um, officers and firefighters on the floor that have projects or programs. Where they are not there on a regular basis, there has to be some consistent point of contact. And what we've found is there's enough administrative work for uh, the deputy and, I, deputy and I that she really serves as the point of contact for some of those smaller issues that we have to deal with, whether it's um, tracking of invoices, um, uh, reaching out for uh, scheduling inspections for the fire inspector, assisting with uniform purchases, um, where uh, the deputy's been out, she's been very instrumental in uh, um, helping me coordinate and organize the hiring process uh, that we're going through right now. 
scheduling appointments, just a whole host of um, administrative tasks um, that would either go by the wayside or be significantly delayed um, if we didn't have her in that spot. Those are the, the key functions that uh, she's she's performing uh, for us right now. She does answer the phone. Um, as Dan said, uh, she is that that uh, that point of contact for people calling in from the outside with requests or stuff like that. And she does really well at funneling callers to the appropriate place so problems can be managed. And actually, she she streamlines the process a little bit now because she's got enough information that she's able to answer some of those questions for us. So it, it reduces some of the load uh, downstream. Um, as far as how that program uh, is managed in general, the Public Safety Administration, you'll find it's all budgeted primarily through the police department. So when we look at administrative costs like uh, copier toner, uh, copy of rental fees, all that stuff. Um, that's that's managed uh, through the police department. It was always managed that way, um, or I should say, it's been managed that way since I got here. And rather than breaking it out and and putting somebody else over it, um, we just kind of left it that way. So we know how the money's flowing and uh, who's purchasing what and when they're purchasing it, stuff like that. Rather than reinvent the wheel, that's that's the crux of uh, public safety administration um, uh, for us. Um, if you look at uh, the budget this year, or I'm sure that you've been through the budget this year, you'll see that we do have a, there is a percent increase. It's smaller than the previous years. Previous years, we came in at about 13% per year over the previous two years. This year, I believe we're down to somewhere around 9%. Let me look at my cheat sheet here real quick to make sure I'm not lying to you. This year, I believe our increase is down to uh, 9 Nine percent overall for the public safety budget, uh, for the, the fire range of the public safety budget, if you will. And I remind you that it covers both uh, salary and benefits for the fire department. It covers operational costs, so that's fleet maintenance, that's equipment, that's training, um, uniforms, personal protective equipment, uh, self-contained breathing apparatus repair, all of those things within the operations. It also covers uh, emergency medical services. Um, within emergency medical services, we have uh, supplies that we have to purchase, both durable and non-durable. Uh, we have uh, contracts, um, service contracts to make sure the equipment is is maintained and is certified by a third-party vendor. We have training expense, um, and I think that's pretty much it for the for the biggest drivers of that EMS budget. We have a public health budget, and we have the emergency management budget also. Um, those are smaller lines. They're kind of uh, standby lines. The emergency management budget was actually starting to be utilized a little bit more uh, over the last couple of months. I've started um, focusing on redoing the emergency operations plan for the town. I have somebody that will take that over for me uh, because it isn't done yet. Also updating uh, components of the emergency operations center within the fire department. That includes audiovisual equipment. That includes um, things like uh, dry erase boards, uh, things like um, easel charts, those types of things that we would need during a, an incident or a, a disaster or a major event that we had to respond to. And the public health line um, has kind of, I've, we've called some money back out of that, I believe, this budget cycle. Um, where COVID has gone away and our, our requests, actually, I say gone away, where COVID isn't the issue that it has been, where our requests for service are have decreased um, I went ahead and decreased that budget to what I think is reasonable. And out of that line, what I would foresee the next chief or the next public health person doing is starting some type of informational campaign on things that are uh, prevalent in the community. Like, for example, we know that falls are the biggest drivers for recent medical service response in order, without question. And um, really, there should be some type of uh, education and campaign that, that comes out of that line to address that issue to start with. And then we can look at um, other things that drive issues in, in Orono, whether it's um, swimming safety or, or whatever it is that, that we think we might need. Also having that placeholder there helps us in the event that we have another um, uh, endemic or pandemic come up that we need to deal with um, where we can um, uh, distribute information, uh, provide uh, resources, that type of stuff. Also out of the uh, emergency management line, some of the sheltering stuff that we do when we do warming and cooling centers and whatnot as we start to develop uh, those more thoroughly. And again, I, I believe the person will be taking this over after me. I've already laid some foundations so they can analyze some stuff. Um, 
that they will be able to use those those fundings to help better support those and, and better identify. So that's really where those those are. Hazardous materials uh, is is pretty much a consistent uh, pocket of money that comes to us. Um, we have, um, and I did not write this down and I should have, I apologize. Do you have the revenues out of the county? Should be the county and the end designated territories. Or uh, yeah, I have not. So out of, out of the federal government, um, we're getting a little over $20,000 now to fund the hazardous materials team. 39.5, uh, uh, that's from FEMA. I think that's so that I think that's combined is what that is. I think we're getting a little over Penobscot, 32. Okay, Penobscot is 32,000. So you main contribution 75. Thank you very much for having that there. So it must have, I thought it was only going over 20, but like 39 is probably right from the federal government share to operate hazardous materials. And out of that money, um, we pretty much fund the entire hazardous materials team. That includes equipment replacement. That includes half the annual physical cost. So we split every year we're required to do annual physicals for both the fire department and the hazmat team. So what we do is we just split it down the middle. The town eats half. Uh, we eat half of that expense uh, to cover those physicals. Um, all the equipment that needs to be replaced, um, we uh, use the money for that. So very frequently we'll have to replace uh, sensors and the gas meters. We'll have to replace pipettes for sampling of uh, materials, um, we have to send uh, meters and um, uh, dosimeters and other things out for testing on a regular basis. And those all measure chemicals in the air, they measure chemicals in the water, they measure uh, radioactive materials, um, those types of things. All of that is funded through that. Now, occasionally there will be a big purchase that will come up that we'll need to uh, use both the federal money, the county money, and um, unallocated uh, hazmat funds that we carry in our own budget here uh, to make those purchases. And, and one of those purchases that we did uh, not too long ago was the Ragaku um, spectrometer, which basically shoots a laser beam at a piece of material and tells us what it is. And some of that came out of undesignated uh, hazmat funds in, from the town, and the rest came out of uh, federal money that, that we had available to us that came from the state. Um, I'm sorry, I have a question. Yeah, I just I just had a question about the hazmat. So I understood there's federal dollars and county dollars, and then we have some of our own dollars. Does the university contribute anything toward our hazmat? We pay for hazmat. So they have seventy nine hundred dollars that they contribute directly to hazmat, and then as I understand it, the the endowment that we received the six hundred and some odd thousand dollars also uh, is intended to contribute to hazmat, EMS, uh, uh, firefighting and a few other uh, resources in the community that we, we support them with. That's the payment in lieu of taxes, the pilot, 634. Is there actually some memo associated with that that we receive? Like, um, or, or is there a memo? My understanding is it's kind of been a spoken agreement that's been kind of very lightly around. <laughs> it has been paid in full this year. What's that going for us? But I've always heard it had something that it was primarily fire when they get rid of fire. But it's all like it's just kind of in word of mouth. It seems yeah, that was the history. Is when when the fire department went away, there was some talk about how to how to fund it. I think originally it was around the fire truck, yeah. buying a fire truck, and that has stayed there. Uh, we are maybe the only community that receives a pilot from any of the university systems. So. Just, just as a, they're aware of that, but we, you know, yeah, it's kind of like golden goose question or, you know, opportunities to be followed up on question or yeah. Yeah. interesting. My other question was, you mentioned something about warming stations kind of in passing. Do we actually have designated warming stations in the town that, I mean, is this only for when the power goes out or do we also have them if folks were homeless here in town or during a storm or what, what do we provide in that? So, regard? So what we provide right now is a place for people to come in and get warm and charge their phones. They aren't technically warming stations. There's a whole process that you need to go through to have a, a true warming station. Um, it's not it's not 
insurmountable. It's just making sure you have documents in place and you're doing the things that you're you're supposed to do. Um, and some of that requires a check in and check out, like you would do with a shelter and in those types of things. So um, that is that is on top on tap rather for this fall to have a, a formal process in place. Um, one thing that we don't have the capacity for is overnight sheltering. Um, and unfortunately that's when it gets the coldest and we don't have that capacity because it requires a whole separate set of, of, uh, criteria as far as places to sleep, who's going to monitor it and check in, check out. And do you have a place to bring pets and, and all those other things? And sheltering is, is far beyond our abilities right now. However, warming and cooling centers are, are something that we can do, um, um, usually during the, the daytime or operating hours, unfortunately. And it's they, just the limitations on the community. So they get a, do many people come and take advantage of those? or So I think as word gets out, we see more people. I know during the December storm, we saw more people show up uh, that were without power yeah. um, for charging. I know the library uh, had uh, quite a few people show up. Um, I know we've had some people show up here at the town office as well. Yeah. And then, you know, as as people report out to us that they're having issues or whatever, we do whatever we can from the emergency management perspective to either help them find sheltering or um, or other other overnight accommodations or or figure out what we can as far as where they are on the priority list for Brissant or, or mm -hmm. whoever the case may be. The problem that we run into a lot of times is people don't want to leave or they don't want to go away from their home or whatever the case may be. And they, they demand immediate service and that's just not how it happens in a disaster. So, you know, I can, I can afford you an off, a, a place to go in Bangor to shelter overnight, or whatever, but there's just, there's no way I can get Brissant to your house to, to restrain you know, those types of things. So. It's, um, it strikes me as both like a good, resource to have available when needed, even if not needed, but it also sends a signal to people that this is an event that you need to take seriously. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. they're thinking about the resiliency of communities. We had a great report that Megan um, has put together, I don't know if she put it together, or if she worked with university uh, colleagues to bring it to us, but it was really a lot to think about in terms of what we're to do to become even more resilient. And it seems to be a fact of life that we have to be more and more, so. Okay. Um, your areas of, of concern, staffing, and you talk about, I mean, it's a regional thing, maybe it's a national thing. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, I, I think you've sort of answered my question here that there's, you know, there's a lack of research to explore this, but who would that, because it's, it seems like it's a pretty systemic issue that some national fireman foundation or somebody would be putting resources towards coming up with solutions versus, yeah, we just can't get any people. <laughs> well, you would you would think that, um, but- <laughs> The big in, government solution requested in, by Leo Kenny. In the <laughs> fire service- No, local. In the fire service, we like to do things repetitively and get the same results <laughs> and think that next time we do it, it's gonna be different. So <laughs> what we're tending to do nationally is is throw money at it and throw benefits at it because 20 years ago, that's what we needed to do. And the times have changed and the demographics have changed and the values of people have changed. And unfortunately, until people like the International Association of Fire Chiefs or the International Association of Firefighters or the Volunteer Fire, uh, uh, well, uh, there's a national group for volunteer firefighters. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful to them. I just can't remember who they are right off the top of my head. Or any one of those uh, stepped up to the plate and said, let's come together and really look at what makes person X in middle school right now think and what are they gonna wanna do in four to six years? That's where the focus needs to be looked at. And it's just not, we're just there. It's not there because again, we like to beat our heads and spin our wheels until something finally breaks. Um, ideally, where I think the research is going to have to start from, and I'm not saying it's not out there now, but it has to pick up some speed. I think maybe the the um, Muskie School of Public Policy picking something up and chasing it, or maybe the Political Science Department up here at UMaine um, chasing it, or something along those lines. This is a this is a true. If somebody was looking for a PhD in um 
in in leadership or municipal government or public policy or whatever, this would really, I think, be a place that they could put some effort and be impactful nationally mm. to address this issue. Yeah, and it's it's not, I can tell you for a fact, it's not what everybody's doing because it, it does not work. And it's not getting rid of income taxes or giving you a tax break or anything like that. There is there's a deeper issue here that has to be explored and addressed. And um, I can hypothesize about it all day, but it, it's going to take it's going to take an institution with some backing to to make this happen. Interesting. That's a, it, the Muskie schools. That's an interesting proposition. So yep. we appreciate that insight. Although this might counteract what you just said, I also was just curious: what year are we in in the fire union contract? I know um, Chief Merrill. Well, right? Are we yeah. currently negotiating a new one? So that still isn't. But it's factored into this budget, and we are close. Okay, that's what I'm um, It expires June 30th. We're working. But it's factored, the expectations from that negotiation is factored into the budget now, right? Yes, and my expectation is that we'll we bring something back to you soon. soon. Got it. Can we also ask questions about some of these additional fire documents we sure. got? Is that can, I, can I ask about uh, just on the budget line stuff? Um, page, it's page 32, blank of 201. <laughs> Big hole. Um, it's the unscheduled overtime. Yep. Uh, so we budgeted 30, spending 158 this year. We blew that up. For, and we knew we you kept us well in the in the loop on all of that. Um, I. You were, we're going from budgeted of 30 up to budgeted 100, and I, I maybe we're, we were full staff for a minute. Um, I'm just wondering once we're, if we're actually full staff, that would seem like a large increase from year to year. Right, is this anticipating that we're not going to, that holding full staff is going to be a challenge or? Yeah, so it's so uh, Cornell and I uh, talked about this when we did our, our uh, meeting on the budget. And I came in at 30 again, because that's basically where we had. And uh, after some discussion, um, we're so volatile. The whole market's volatile, really. We're so volatile over there right now. We thought it wouldn't be prudent to just stay at 30 and then run so far into the red again. I, As it is right now, I have two vacancies that we're getting ready to uh, test for. And um, there are some really good candidates that have some experience um, that are that are in the pipeline for these these vacancies. I don't know how they're going to pan out through interviews and background and stuff, but but I would hope that we're going to be fully staffed here in the next two to three months, like everybody. And we're 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 already seeing the group that we just brought on, where they've been through EMT school, we've got them through the initial firefighter training. We're already seeing a reduction in overtime. I think this last week I had three or four overtime shifts I had to fill as compared to, you know, eight, 10 or 12, you know, depending on, on what was going on in the, in the months previous. So I'm already starting to see some reduction. The question is, is, am I going to be able to sustain it? And I just don't know. Um, so like I said, rather than, rather than throw a fictitious number out there, um, it seemed like it'd be better to inflate it and hope that we can um, not spend it for lack of a better way. Any but, other reason mm -hmm. we, Put more in is the new hires have to go to intermediate school. Oh, that's so right. as they start to go to that, then that's going to be another open shift. So we are starting to fill the slots, but they need more education because they have to get to paramedic level according to the contract. So um, that's why we did go to 158, but we did want to put some in there to cover that next phase up there. So with with these, the purpose of having the sixth person on the shift is to one, when we have all six people there, get closer to what we really need on the fire ground to work. But when we're down a person, that's a shift of overtime we don't have to hire for. That's the that's the purpose of having that sixth person. So you can run the place with five. Yeah. You prefer to have six. And but if you schedule with five and somebody didn't show up. Then you'd be looking at over time okay. every time. Yeah. And is that what the callback number is? The callback number is if everybody's out of the station yeah. and nobody else is there, then we call people back. Yeah. That's all that is. Okay. And then but that's 
That's an interesting way to think about it in terms of why the six person staffing and the five and what that it's hard to maybe quantify that. How often do you think that happens to you there? Yeah, you quantify, you quantify. I mean, I just wanted to mostly say thank you to yeah. you and to Zach. Like, this is excellent. I know you gave us a lot of information last year, and then Zach gave us the number part that was missing last year, and then you corrected some parts that Zach wouldn't have known about how the overtime worked, like you just were explaining to yeah. Dan, that the sixth person um, can cover. I mean, it allows to have one person out, and you can still function with five, which was really well explained in all of your information. Um, I guess I had a question, but even before that, I just wanted to point out for my fellow counselors, if they haven't done the math on Zach's numbers yet, that one thing that's really helpful on here is it really lays out for us that when we, in 2021, moved from three shifts of five to four shifts of five, you might think that that would have been a huge cost addition because that's five whole additional people. But actually, that only raised our cost by 100000 for that entire five people because all that was was benefits for five new people. It wasn't actually more hours um, because they used to work more hours when there were less people per week. They worked that 56 hours a week instead of 42. So if you do this math, that only we got five whole people for only just a hundred thousand dollars when that increase mm -hmm. happened, which is just phenomenal, right? To get that much extra help. Um, so I'm looking at additional document. What letter is that one? Page 194. Yeah, it is page 194. Um, I think it's additional document L, maybe. Is that something else? What's the M? What is it? At the end, do we have it? I don't know. It's on 194. I don't know if it has a letter anymore, just a number. Do you okay, see yeah. it, Leo? Got a little, yep. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, if you take a look at these great numbers that the chief and Zach put together for us, um, you can look at the second column, the three shifts of five, and then you can look at the fourth column, which is the four shifts of five, um, and see that people used to work 56 hours a week and they now only work 42. And so literally hours count is the same. It's the same 840 hours of paying people to work. It's just more people who are doing those hours, but the hours stayed the same. So if you add up the total yearly wages of 1,841,000 versus 1,900,000 on the fourth column and the estimated overtime down below, the 241 and the 284, you get a number which shows you that we only went up in cost around approximately $100,000, which I assume is people's benefits for those extra five people, um, for a lot of extra people. And I just think, I mean, that's yeah. really, Thank really you. well shown and yeah, really terrific that that's laid out there for us. Obviously, um, in that estimated yearly overtime, those numbers are individual, obviously, right? That's what yeah. that number is in the third, third row down. Yeah, those what is this? Those okay. are hours, not... Those are those are hours, estimated yearly hours of overtime. Oh, cost. total yeah. hours. Okay. Yep. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. For, so that was really, really helpful, I thought, to see that how that transition happened. And I know you've talked before about how important that transition is for staff well-being and mental health and retention and to be comparable with all the towns around us who are all on these four shift rotations, not three. So I just I just wanted to point out to council that, you know, financially that did not cost us anywhere near what you might have imagined, right? And I think that's really important data. So super important super to have. Super helpful. Um, so thanks. I, um, I'm i interested in the numbers. I know we're like, we're like 15 months into this 36 month experiment with the sixth person, right? Which is currently grant funded. So we started it for, correct me if I'm wrong, February in 2023, I think your memo said. I think we're 15 months in, and it's a 36 month yeah, grant. Yeah. So we currently have the sixth the sixth person on our our shifts is being funded by a grant right now, and that grant expires in February of 2026. So those four positions are currently grant funded, correct? There are three positions that are currently grant funded. Okay, and the fourth we already had. The fourth we already had because they were serving a role as a as a full person. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So that's really helpful. Um, um, can I, just I have ask another one, but you on this, um, there was at some point four shifts of four 
each person work their base of 42 hours. There was a four shifts of four. Did and, and you just talked about if there's six and then one's not there, we'd have to call in. If there were five and then one's not there, we would have to call in. At some point, that is what the staffing was. It was at, designed to be four. At the fifty, yes, at the fifty-six hour model. But that was a that was a, a short term. Thing. I think you see there it was it was run during uh, twenty ten to twenty thirteen. We actually never um, ran. That, that says um, we never ran four of four, Leo. If you look at the data, they provided. it was four and three is what yeah. we ran. We never ran four shifts of four people. It never happened. That's a hypothetical. Three shifts of yeah. four back there. You got three shifts of five. Four shifts of four is the middle row. But it didn't happen. If you read the notation, it says have not utilized the staffing level. Do you see right under it? There it is. I'm going reading as I go here. I know. There. It's good. <laughs> it was just so well presented and That's really great. clear and just super. incredibly helpful. So thanks. I had some questions about we're sort of halfway through this sort of experiment on trying the sixth person. Um, and I I have some questions about that. I'm, I'm thinking council may want to delve into that further at another time that's not the budget. Um, I don't know. I you know ran the math on that too with the new number that you provided, um, the correction to the overtime number. So um, if you'll see the overtime number in the last column that says 348, 596. Um, Chief Lowe's memo corrects that figure to 241.680. So does that mean the overtime overtime hours are also that is inflated? the over that is the overtime hours. 72, 73. Oh yeah, the hours would be wrong also. Okay. I assume. Okay. All right, good. I assume. Chief Lowe was pointing out that that's what he explained to us earlier that you know there was no reason Zach would know that they don't pull in somebody when one person's out. They wait till two people are out before they call somebody in for overtime. So, so those numbers are are incorrect for the four shifts. That's a German the yeah. memo back in the memo that Pete just sent us. Yeah, just like a few days ago. We could yeah. right? So I didn't I didn't break down yeah. exact hours in the memo I sent you. I think all I did is sent you the two forty one was the yeah six eighty yeah which is really helpful to have. So that correct figure is the two forty one six eighty there. Um, so overtime costs have actually. Going down. Going down. Yeah. Okay. Like 40,000 with that model. Okay. Um, which is really, really great to see. Um, and if we do this math, if we add, you know, the yearly wages and overtime here and compare to what we had with four shifts of five, this cost jump is significantly more. This is a cost jump of around 300,000 when we jumped and added the sixth person. So, you know, we have grants now that are about to expire, but the real cost for that is higher. It's about 300,000. And I do think that's something that, you know, we need to talk about as a council, what extra benefit we're getting from that and the, the weight on the cost at some point before the grants run out. I think it's, you know, an obligation of council to have that discussion. I agree. Can I, I'm, this isn't probably the best time to do this, but um, well, you said something about 241. So if you go down the four shifts of six, the, the furthest to the right, the 72, 73 is not accurate and the 303 is not accurate. Is that right? We think so. Is that right, Chief? Does that sound right? Think because so. would it, I mean, it's showing yeah. higher than. Yeah. If, I don't. What it's showing mean? higher so than the four shifts. Hour five. counts can't be right. So the seventy-two, yeah. seventy-three is in the four shifts of six column. That's high. Yeah. So yeah. that is on the high side. I calculated it a little differently than. Yeah. So the number that I have there is forty-eight fifty-two. Is that? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most recent document you sent me was was forty eight fifty two. Yep. For the app. And then the and then, per person down below, I have one one ninety four. Thanks. Oh yeah. Okay. Thanks. And that obviously changes that three forty eight to two forty. It changes to two forty one six eighty and fifty seven cents. I think in wow. the chief's memo. That's very precise. Was it um, memo? Uh, it came in this additional packet. It's the next page in your, I don't know. I have it in here. I don't know. What the last page, page of mine. I don't know if that has a page number, but it came in our updated binder. Um, it's dated May, dated May 2nd of 2024. And it has the nice colorful fire department seal on it. You didn't get that one? I got my lens at 20, page 201. Oh, it was in the fire department. It says there were no fire department yeah, with the red and yellow. 6C memo. 
Those should face you too, correct? I don't know. I'll get it to you. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, I do think that at some point we need to have that discussion as we're halfway through this trial of trying out six as opposed to five. And Chief Lowe really laid out for us in his earlier memo a year ago, um, the importance of understanding double and triple calls and how many people go out on calls. Um, and I think, you know, that's a long discussion we may not wanna have tonight, but I just wanna flag for council. It's important because we're in this experiment and we need to take a look at it at some point. I did want to just verify, Chief Lo, I read through your memo from last year again, and I'll, you're very clear, but I may not be catching certain things. The typical ambulance we send out goes with two staff. Is that typically who rides in the ambulance when a call comes in? Yes. Okay. And the fire truck typically goes out with how Three. many? Three. Three. Okay. Um, and go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Um, so the fire truck typically goes with three. The ambulance typically goes with two. Um, you gave us really good data a year ago on double calls and triple calls over a five-month time period, which is also very helpful for council to look at again. Um, so my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, if we had double ambulance calls, that's four people going out for two in each ambulance? At, at least four people, okay. uh, depending on the type of call. Okay. It may take all five. Okay, but a triple ambulance call on a staffing of five can't be handled because there's only five people, whereas with six people, it potentially could, although we only have two ambulances, right? So, so how does that work? What would happen if we had a, a third ambulance call, depending on what the other two calls were, either the, the captain who's left in the station would first respond to provide some level of care, the deputy, I, or the um, the fire inspector would first respond, or we might all go, depending on the situation, yeah. and use what we had for equipment. Sure. On a third ambulance call, we can't transport. We don't have we don't have a third ambulance, so so you can't transport no matter how many staff, but you can send a staff member or two in the fire chief's truck or something. Is that correct? Yes. And that's what you said you did, I think, in your memo. That's yeah. why I was checking, because it said somewhere the fire chief goes in the truck, and I was trying to yeah. figure that out. Okay. Um, and then um, as far as when we get the double calls that are like one EMS call and one fire call, if there's two on an EMS and three in the fire truck, we can respond to double calls at five. Yes but it's better if we have six because there's an extra person on the fire truck. Is that what happens to the extra person then when we have six or what happens with that? If we have six, there would be, yeah, there would be two that would stay on the fire truck, two on the first ambulance, two in the second ambulance. So we that is three potentially then. Is that three calls or just an ambulance and a fire truck going to the fire? So if we have six people, what would, what would usually happen and again, this depends on the acuity of the call. Two would go out on the first ambulance. Two would go out on the second ambulance. And then you can still have some level of fire protection and EMS protection okay. in the town with six people. As it is right now, if both ambulances go and they only have two people on them, you only have one person left in the station, basically all you have is somebody to make phone calls and ask for help. Yep. They're, they're essentially ineffective to do to do much of anything. I mean, we, I say we go out to medical calls and we do, and we'll take blood pressures and give oxygen if we have to, but there's only so much that we're capable of doing as, as one person in a vehicle show on. Okay. So that helps. So the fire trucks really should go with three, but in a pinch, if both ambulances are out, the fire truck goes with two. Yep. Okay. I get it. Thank you. Super helpful. Um, I would encourage counselors to read. I made my own compilation of all the wonderful data that the chief provided. I'm happy to share out also, but I think it's just important that at some point we have that discussion. Yeah, it's Councilor, Councilor Marks, I might also yeah. recommend that, that you and the rest of the council look at the general overview of fire department operations that I put out back in uh, 24, which answers a lot of those questions about how many people does it take to respond to a fire call or a ice rescue or, or um, cardiac arrest or those types of things. That information is in there. Um, the uh, There's information in there about how fast we should be arriving at a building fire in the event um, that that happens. Um, and then there's a lot of information in there about statutes and standards that we would be held accountable to if, if we um, alter our staffing or if we look at um, uh, 
you know, reducing or whatever it is that we do. That's just as if you're, if you're looking for information, this is this is the core of why we staff and why we need to do in addition to the budget stuff. And so you shared that in an email or where was that overview shared in? Sorry. I don't Sorry. think you're, you're not talking about this memo from 2023. No. You're talking about something from 2024. Yeah, yeah. this was FY 2024. Yeah. I think Sophie distributed. I know it went out to, it was made available to the townspeople. We can certainly get you a copy of Could it. You again? Yeah. That'd be, really, that'd be really helpful too. Yes, I remember it, but I don't think that we ever got a copy in the budget binder this time, and I'm not sure we did last time either. So yeah, I don't, I don't think you, I know you didn't get one this yeah. time. Thank you, Chief. Though. Really helpful. I appreciate all the information, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. It's interesting experiment to be in the middle of, and it's going to be an interesting yeah. conversation. Thanks. I have a tangent question, but does anyone have any more? Well, first of all, Chief, do you have anything else? To press ahead on or no, I just wanted to remind everybody of of, uh, of that document. I think if you look at the budget, I mean, our biggest driver is overtime. Yeah. I have, I understand, um, I understand the pressure. I know the school is going to be coming in with some pretty uh, significant requests. So we tried to stay as flat as we could, um, but still be responsible in some areas. And that's, that's, um, that's where we're at. If yeah. you could have, yeah, I mean, you could have made the job of passing a budget yeah. easier, but you made it better, I think, with being as accurate as you can be. So I appreciate it. It's a good budget. Question, um, capital reserves, you made mention of that in your discussion. Does the fire department, it, your discussion said there's a capital reserve for, I think, um, protective equipment. Does the fire department have a capital reserves budget to, you know, replace, yeah, capital equipment? And how is that funded if we do? So the only capital budget that we have right now, there are two. We have one for uh, ambulances. We have one for the fire truck, right? We didn't get anything else set up, did we? Um, there is a reserve in the hazmat fund for equipment as well. Okay. So those are the only three reserve accounts that we have right now. Okay. Uh, and so it said that the ambulance one is not being funded this year. Is that what I read correctly? Right, because we just got one last year. Okay, and there is an ambulance fund, but we have started um, that we will replenish at a rate enough to buy us a new ambulance when we need a new ambulance. Mm -hmm. okay. And fire hose and air compressor. Ladder, okay, and not the ladder truck. Uh, EMS monitors and one more year of uh, SCPs. <clears throat> this maybe is a. Touchy subject, but I just love the ladder truck. <laughs> you can ask all you want. <laughs> oh, so, we heard that they were checking it out uh, a month or so or three weeks or something ago. So I'm waiting for Captain Hardison to return to tell me the next latest and greatest story in the saga of the ladder truck. <laughs> and I honestly thought it would be back when I got back. And uh, I can, because uh, I was going to talk to you today, but I can get a chance that they sent a bill and um, Zach was going to pay it. It was 70, 72,000. 72, um, and I assumed we had the truck. Uh, well, we don't have the truck. We found more issues. Um, and the council approved an order uh, of 27. So I need to have a, uh, a kind of a report to get back to you with a, a new order and what the time frame is on getting the truck and what the issues are. So, so it's three times what we thought we we're going to pay, and it's not done, and it's, and it's still not, and it's not fixed. Is that the, the exactly crux of it? It's what it feels like, yeah. And the new one is one nine. Is that kind of the number that's been tossed around in the bonding budget? Two, two nine, two. two. What you happens with the rotating ladder nine. trucks that are sometimes here from other towns? How does that work? Like, do they just generously park them here at certain time periods or what, what happens when That's, the EV truck is here or? So BZ, um, BZ is covering us while our ladder truck comes out. So any call that we would normally send a ladder truck to, BZ comes up. And because our mutual aid with VZ is normally somewhat lopsided, we saw an opportunity to kind of balance that out. So they are responding on all the calls that we would normally have our ladder truck go to. And, uh, I, whoever uh, takes my place, I'm going to recommend that they continue to to have them respond because there is some benefit um, to insurance ratings by having an additional 
our fire truck come into our community on the first call. So I'm going to be looking for them to uh, to continue that relationship or that that policy, I guess I should say. Um, yeah, and it's beneficial for VZ. I mean, it's uh, they get to come up here, they get to see how we operate, what we do, they get to train in our buildings and. Um, you know, if we're busy at a call, they're going to be one of the first ones coming in as long as over time. So it's it's beneficial. It sucks. Do we pay them for that? Or is this a reciprocal thing that we've helped them out over the years and other things and they're helping us out with this? Or how is that? So any fire service mutual aid, um, there is no there's no payment for um, unless it was something really dramatic, like you needed our bumper truck and a crew to go to a scene to help you out for like a week and a half or something like that. I would look for a recuperation or something like that, but just generally going towns, we don't, we don't bill each other for that. EMS is a whole different story, but fire, fire department. Thank you. I wanted to, could I ask a, my tangent question now? We've passed the point. So, yes, there's a um, community paramedicine. Do you see that as an opportunity eventually for communities to get in the business of providing home health care to in some function or some capacity uh, as a revenue source. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah it's it's already being done. Um there are there are um blossoming streams, I guess for lack of a better way to put it right now that, that haven't come into uh, full acceptance yet, but it's it's um, slowly gaining acceptance. Um, there are successful programs in the state. There is some revenue out there for it. I don't think it's anything that we would want to get involved in just yet. We need to keep an eye on it. And the problem is, is um, like I've said before, and I know Councilor Kenny cringes when I say this, but um, to to do that function, um, we I couldn't we couldn't do it with on duty staff. We would have to do it with. With a community paramedic, but we have like we have the infrastructure, right? I mean, it yeah, seems like sure. it could be an opportunity for not, you know, it's not like we're building a home, a new home health care agency. We have a lot, and there's a um, reception, and I think it's a, it could be a great, you know, community building model mm -hmm. for you know for our residents, particularly if people who need care in their homes. Um, love to have them served by people who are part of the our fire department, is you know, right. as opposed to. It could not in any way disparage home health workers who work for other agencies, but I think it could be a well, it really isn't it's an augment to home health in a lot of ways because they're just as taxed as, mm -hmm. as everybody else. Yep. And that person's not just a resource for um, community paramedicine, but they can be a resource to support code in situations or emergency management or you know uh, emergency scenes or just going out and talking to the public in general, kind of doing what Ed does, but in a, in a different, from a different viewpoint. If you yeah. Yep. So thank you for bringing me into the conversation. I just, <laughs> I don't want you to forget me. <laughs> <laughs> I have always, this is always, this has been a line of interest and yes, I'm always uh, staff conscious. And I have my question in here was because um, it said, we need more staffing to uh, could, does not afford the flexibility to provide um, to reliably provide this servers service. My question was, could we start thinking about sporadically providing service with the staff we have in place? So you've asked me that before. So I'm going to tell you again. Um, the challenge the challenge we have with that is um, we can do it, but if we do it, we have to pay overtime for it. And it can only be one or two people if we're going to be doing overtime to do that. And I'm not sure that we have the interest next door to do that right now. Um, the second thing is, is we have um, these, these patients actually have appointments like home health. Yeah. So I would need to set an appointment. If I was going to do go down, if you're a, a person who has asthma or emphysema and I need to go down and do a spirometry test on you and have you blow into the tube, um, that's usually an appointment. I just can't do it as a, as a drop-in thing. And as this service becomes, if, as people become more aware of this service, I expect giving the, the senior population in Orono is going to pick up um, with, for more demand to, to provide it. Not only that, it seems logical that you would have this person also serve in the public health role and maybe take that position on as well and move it out from underneath my hat or whoever's hat that's going to wear it after me um, where they are more 
they'll be more in tune with those those public health pieces. So, in I guess my thinking is like I think we did or do some well calls, maybe well visits. I don't. I think we did at some point. I th probably when you had a nurse here, yeah. Well, I thought we've done it since since we haven't had a nurse for quite a while. I think. So I thought I, there was some level of that that happened on occasion. So and just thinking if that could be more. I think during COVID it happened where I know I personally went out a few times and talked to people and um, unofficially maybe assisted with tests and, and that type of thing. Um, but um, there has been no formal structure or anything like that. For us to do community paramedicine, we have to have a program in place. It has to be approved by the state of Maine. And we have to um, we have to be consistent in the service that we we deliver. So you can't just swing back by somebody's place on the way back from the fire call, and yeah. But I, but I do wonder if like yeah. if the if if it's you start with like a well yeah. visit or well call, like I said, even well call, if that if that helps build kind of build the case for like well, now we know what's out there. You know what I mean? Well, I think you've got that data already if you look at the work that Ed Lesky's doing um with his with his good morning calls and going around and, and talking to people and maybe that's what I'm talking about I guess so there is something I, maybe I that's think there's the I think there's a data set out there that you can pull and look at who is who is frail and might benefit from this um or or maybe he's the vehicle for an informal survey where where you go out and, and he meets with people at, at the um, the community center during coffee or during his well good morning calls or whatever and says hey what do you think about this is this is this something that you think you could use and are you serviced by home health now or do you not qualify because of X Y Z and you know those types of things so I think I think there's an avenue to to collect that information and I think some of it already exists I just haven't put the time into to gathering yet with everything else. Understood. Chief, are there any communities around us already have community paramedicine happening? So the two biggest programs that I know of right now are um, United Ambulance and Lewiston. I think Northern Light has something going on, but I'm not sure how robust it is. Um, and then I, I believe Delta Ambulance in Waterville has a, a program set up. I don't know of any fire departments right now, uh, except for the city of Portland. Um, that has a has a um, community paramedicine, and actually Portland has a uh, physician's assistant in the car in addition to their community paramedics. So, if you got an extra hundred and eight, you want to drop, I'm more than happy to bring the PA in here. Thousand. Okay. I'm yeah, six weeks yeah. It's hard to think about this seriously, obviously, yeah. knowing where you have been on staffing too for yeah. the past right. year. Yeah. So I, I get all of that, but it is a. It is something that I think is still relevant and could could be should be continued to be talked about. We have a there is a certain there's an aging part of our community that probably could <clears throat> yep. there's such a high liability involved with EMS. Well, medicine in general, but in particular, if you're going to be doing home visits and everything else, there's such a high liability and there's such a a uh, niche level of uh, niche area of knowledge that you have to have that just having anybody go and do it isn't it, it it would make for a bad system that would get bad results i believe that just like you wouldn't want a the home health care worker responding to a fire right so um uh, uh, yeah, yeah. No. thank you um anything is there anything in the contract that precludes that kind of exploration for the town no. Um, okay. So. And not that I'm suggesting anybody counter offer with anything that would, but no. Okay. So more to talk to about that, but not necessarily for this budget, certainly. So anything else for Chief Flo? Yeah. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else on from your end, Cornell, before we talk nope. schedule and what's next? Nope. So um, any public comment? Okay. Pete, you'll let us know if anyone is has their hand raised or if um, Council Bertzel has anything to share. No hands raised online at this time. And I have nothing to add other than thanks to all involved. I thought it was a really great discussion today. Okay, thank you. Um, kind of like to wait for Cornell to come back, but um, in terms of our discussion as a council, in terms of what comes next, um, 
we're going to have a placeholder on as well. I, I want to see what availability would be on Thursday, May 14th. So two days from now, I know Jacob can't meet on Wednesdays, but um, Wait, today's the 14th. Thursday the 16th. What? Yeah. Thursday, Thursday. This Thursday, May 16th. Sorry. Okay. Thank you for the catch. Um, for a special council meeting for an update on the uh, town manager negotiations. Is there, in all fairness, can we do it before? Because Orno Economic Development Council is at 6 30. So if we could do it before then. Yeah, I would like to do it as early as we can. So. No, yeah. I missed. Can we do it? Is it 530? Yeah, no. Two birds with one stone. I am traveling to Texas. I don't know what time I'm going to be in the air, to be honest. Uh, I feel like I might be there by then. Okay. So we'll call you in. Okay. We shoot for five o'clock and try and do it in a half an hour. I would think a half an hour, but what time's the OEC? Uh, 6 6 30. So see, I am serving yeah. town three days this week. I know you are. I love, very it. Much. I love it. Four days last week. I know. I'm Thank paying you, attention. You I'm taking I'm taking attendance. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna see about getting your road paid. <laughs> and fiber, fiber. We got yeah. We will put the fiber in first, and I'll um, pay yeah, we'll need to stop. All right, uh, all right. So <laughs> Thursday, May sixteenth. Is it? I mean, is it easier on staff though if we do it at five as opposed to five thirty? Or I gotta be here all the whole thing. Oh yeah, with so sorry. As well, long as before that, it matters to me. I'd rather it not be at eight. Yeah. If you got it. <laughs> I mean, could we do it? At, would it be easier on that? We did it at four thirty, or does it have to be at five by staff? He's saying he has it to doesn't staff. matter either way because I'm going to be here till six thirty. So wait well, for the oh yeah, okay. so five o'clock. So five o'clock. Five five o'clock is okay. I was hearing that five thirty would be just as good, and later is slightly better for me if we could do five thirty. Might be Dan. No, might be let's do five thirty. Okay, we don't need more than an hour. Let's do five thirty. Okay. So five thirty. Five thirty. Okay. So update on negotiations and town manager search matters. And if we don't need it for some reason, we'll cancel it, but we'll have to, we have to notice it. So if we could do that. It's just going to be an executive session. Executive yeah. session. No live stream or anything like that. No votes coming out. No votes coming out. Just executive session. Yep. Okay. And then on Monday, May 20th, we have um, a special council meeting as well at the end of the committee meeting or before at the beginning of the committee meeting, right? I'm looking at Cornell now. So we talked about doing, just for informational purposes, we talked about doing we have council committee meetings that evening, but at the start, we'll do a special council meeting to relating to the manager search and potentially the performing arts contract. Uh, right. And then an executive session on your economic development and on Scott property that you had. Oh, the former last, public works building. Yeah, last meeting. I'm looking forward to that. So okay. what time are we starting on Monday? 5 p.m. So regular, regular, regular time. scheduled time. Okay. So I just thought the whole meeting would be a special meeting. Okay, let's do that then. Yep. So we have two special meetings yep. coming up. One on March. Thursday the 16th, one on Monday the 20th. Will you be back? No. Okay. So you'll zoom in? Uh, maybe. I'm not even sure if I'm flying. Oh, it's a short trip. Okay. Okay. Thursday, five thirty. Monday, five. Yep. And then Tuesday, May twenty first, we have our regular, our last regular budget committee workshop, and then that's on public works. And what I, what, you know, and Sarah and I talked about this today, and I've talked with others of you about it. What I would encourage people to do is, you know, come to that the end of that session with thoughts and ideas directionally. We've heard a tremendous amount of information. Staff's done a great job of um, presenting us material. Zach is, you know crunching numbers and updating updating documents and things like that. So at the end of the Tuesday, May 21st, I'd like to take some time to kind of debrief, you know, it'll be a public meeting, a public discussion, but we'll debrief in terms of some of the things we've heard, some of the direction we want to go. And then I think we should charge that next week is Memorial Day weekend. So we don't have a meeting at all the week of May 28th. Um, Memorial Day you'll, put a, you'll put a meeting in there. Probably. I guarantee it. Probably. Um, <laughs> But we don't have, but I think that would be a good time for um, maybe a couple members of the council to work with staff on what we heard and try if there are changes or things like that we want to bring back to the, we have a scheduled session on that last work. Uh, June 3rd. So the thinking would be May 21st, we have a, a general discussion about what we've heard, what we've learned, what we, what the sentiment of the thinking of council is. Um, 
we'll take that and we'll work on some things with, with staff to the extent that we, we need to or can. Um, and then June 3rd is the council review discussion of the municipal budget. Um, and that'll be kind of, we, we'll bring it all together and get it ready to present the budget um, at the public hearing on June 10th. Does that make sense to people? So Dan, on the 21st, what you're asking us in this debrief as counselors is to basically come in and say, I love this budget exactly as it is, or I would like to see operating expenses this much lower, or I want this program added to the budget that's yeah. not there, any changes of that nature. It's our time to bring those forth. That's, is that correct? Trust. That's yep. the time. That's the time. And you know, some of them may be specific. Like I'm going to have on my list will be the $5,000 we talked about for Orno stops. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, some of these things may be a, a trend related, but if you have something specific um, in terms of what you heard, what you prioritize, I think we'd bring it, we'd have that kind of general discussion and that'll give us marching orders in terms of you know, potentially Sarah and I to work with staff or, you know, it could be someone else wants to step in instead of me. I mean, Sarah has the cycle. The, <laughs> done, does a lot of work for all of us. We all benefit from the, the amount of detail that she has, you know, has developed on the budget. So then we come back, council budget workshop, kind of get all our ducks in a row. 21st, it, you're talking about just no. June, tw June 3rd, yeah. Yeah. we come, come back. And that's our that's our council budget workshop, council review, discussion of municipal budget. That's where we say this is what we want to, this is our formalizing what we'll bring into the, the budget, the public hearing, and the public hearing is on June 10th. And at that point, we would present one budget, you know, that that um, the council would present, you know, with the support of the, the manager and uh, in terms of what, what we're bringing forward, and then we'll have a final budget review on the 17th, and we'll put this thing to bed on the 24th. Okay, so changes we want to see, we bring forth on the 21st to have a group discussion about, and mm -hmm. on June 3rd, we get back from okay. staff the possible changes we asked for, and then we talk about that. Yep. Is that correct? I would, yeah, okay. I would. Uh, and what's kind of cart before a horse type thing, you know, we didn't, with an interim manager and Cornell's good work and um, transition and council leadership this year and things like that, you know, well, after this, I think we'll have a conversation about what do we do at the start of the budget process to kind of create sort of a, a really clear expectation, communicate a really clear expectation about what our hopes are, and then what does that mean for what's happening. But that's a that's a future budget conversation, and I'm really grateful for all the work and expertise that's gone into what's before us. Um, it's incredibly, we've been very supportive of the work that uh, things that have come before us in terms of um contract negotiations and things like that and paying uh, people that work for Orono what you know what's required to be to be fair and competitive in the marketplace I'm delighted that we're fully staffed in police I'm delighted that we're making really good progress on fire um so I think those are things that um but that those things cost money and that's reflected in what we have in terms of budget so and there cannot be enough thanks to Zach <laughs> there really cannot yeah. impressive jobs okay. anything else for anybody Thank you all very much. Thank Thanks, you, Brown. All right, off we go. I will. Yeah.